What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Bombs and Birdies podcast. Today, I am joined again by Logan, um, and today we're going to be talking about our reaction to the Full Swing Season 2, possibly even Season 1, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, Live Golf. We're going to choose sides a little bit, talk about uh, Anthony Kim as well, and uh, without further ado, let's dive right in. So, um, first of all, how you doing? Good, man. Good? Yeah, it's good to be back shooting some podcasts. Yeah, things are good. That's good. So I know that, um, what, like, what was your reaction as far as, like, because for me, in my opinion, Full Swing Season 1 was better. I have my own opinions about two, but what, like, what were your thoughts in relation to one versus two? Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing I remember about season two most was that they developed the Joel Damon story yes. quite a bit. And then the other memorable part for me was just that they focused on the Ryder Cup a lot. And I think those are the two things I remember about that season. Mm -hmm. Whereas the first season felt like they were really trying to give you a perspective of all these different players on tour. Yeah. That was sort of the vibe. It was almost a different show in a way. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. Part of part of what I didn't like about season two was that um, I th I didn't think it was all POV based or point of view based. I think like kind of like you said, right? Like these guys were behind the scenes, following their winning tournaments, the behind the scenes leading up, building anticipation, and then this one it was more just like the contrast between PGA Tour versus Live Golf. It was a lot more of, uh, like you said, like Joel Damon. It was a lot more like one-dimensional, a lot more Rory. And then it was a ton about the Ryder Cup and the controversy between, obviously, are they going to have guys from Live Join and so on and so yeah. forth. And I just like, I wasn't a big fan of that. Um, I really like to see kind of what the players deal with behind the scenes because that's what people, essentially what people want to see, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, one part I did think resonated a lot was the at the end of the Joel Damon story, you know, how they're sort of like talking about, they had the life of a caddy almost a little bit in that oh, one, right. which I thought was cool. And and this fact that it's like, some of these guys are kind of still struggling. Yeah. Like as much as they can make a lot of money, if you're not making the weekends, right, then you're making zero money and you're spending money on flights, on training. You've got like coaches and you know maybe psychologists and things like that like it's a big team you have with you to succeed in this game no 100 percent. i mean i think if i'm not mistaken at least for the canadian open only because i know that because when branson was playing i did a little bit of math oh, okay um and i think if you made the cut the last check was like 10 grand or something so oh. it's not like life-changing no but but like yeah like you have at least two thousand dollars a week for your caddy and yeah. that's just like a base rate plus you have whatever other expense if you bring a trainer if you bring a psychologist if you bring those types of people like yeah, that shit adds up big time man and 10 grand if you think about it so that's if you make the weekend that's that's if you come dead last like t59 or whatever the cut line is or t79 whatever the cut line is you're I, at least in that specific event which is a very lower tier you're, event yeah, right. but i think on average it's about like 15 to 25k somewhere in there yeah which sounds sweet it sounds like oh i made 20k this weekend yeah. which is pretty cool for golf but like that goes fast especially because like how how many players make the cut every week it's, right it's not it's not an enormous amount and yeah. like and there's a reason why there's only a floating 125 spots and like the guy that's in 125th on the pga tour like you would you would you, you don't even know who he is no right Absolutely. They even showed that with, I think, Joel Damon, like, yeah. you know, he was like 60th or something. Yeah, so, like, the guys that are inside of the top 100, they are quote-unquote relevant, but they're, I don't think people understand that, that it's very expensive even at the highest level to play this game, and, yeah. like, not all the sponsorship covers all this stuff. So, like, when you see the Rory's, the DJ's, the Tiger's, when they have these hundreds of millions of dollars getting thrown at them from either big companies or whatever, it's like, that's not real life. That's the top 1% of the top 1%. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, how many... Worldwide, how many golfers do you think make a living playing golf? Dude, not many. Even like when I was playing professionally, like if we if we broke even on the year, that was a great year yeah, to be honest. Yeah. Because uh, the only reason I say that is because I was floating myself, um, and I think a lot of other mini tour players and even guys on like guys in the Corn Ferry Tour don't make money. Right. Like like some of the caddies and 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 I even heard a clip of Bryson say this too is like um, sometimes the caddies make more than the players on the Corn Ferry Tour. And like they're playing for like if you win, right. you're winning I think like just over 100, 150 grand like yeah. for the winner. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. like on the PJ Tour, if you win, you're winning over just over a million, million and a half depending on whether it's an elevated event or not. And then yeah. obviously the majors are like double and triple that. Yeah. But that's very few and far between. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about Live and like get your opinion on that is because I think it opened up a lot of room for like, okay, I can make more and work less. Right. I can be home more with the family. I don't have to be on the road as much. I'm not putting my body under that much stress. Mm -hmm. um, I have mixed opinions on both. Um, do I think both can can co coexist? 
probably. That's kind of what we're seeing right now. I mean, I don't know if the Live is actually generating enough money to break even yet or whether it's just that they have deep pockets so far. Yeah. But the only thing I could see is like, I mean, I actually do think if you're putting yourself in the player's perspective, um, you know, it's obviously a really good deal for them, the guaranteed money, all that. Like mm -hmm. a guy like AK is a perfect example where it's like you're washed up maybe might still be good but like mm -hmm. you know what are the odds and that's why he quit golf in the first place right is like realistically even though he had a lot of faith the whole golf world believed that he was a great talent mm -hmm. what are the odds that you know you actually just don't play well like that's a lot of stress and 100 i think it's funny because we look at these players and we look at a guy like john rom and i don't know how much he's worth but it's like Probably over $10 million, hundreds right? Of millions, hundreds of millions. And now it's like hundreds yeah. because of the, the live deal or whatever. Yeah. And you wonder, like, how much is the difference between $10 million and $100 million? To them. Yeah, to them. Yeah, to but them. but it's got to be quite a bit, man. But I got to ask from your perspective, like, that's fine and dandy when we're talking about John Rom, mm -hmm. when we're talking about Phil Mickelson, when we're talking about, like, these massive deals and guys that are switching over. Mm -hmm. But what does it really mean for most of the PGA golfers? Like, Almost all those guys are never going to get that offer, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, if like I love the fact that guys like Phil, guys like guys like Tiger, guys like Rory, like all the big names, they still play mm -hmm. and they still play often. Right. Because at the end of the day, those guys have made more money than they're going to ever be able to spend mm -hmm. in their career, and it's like, okay, well, now what are you playing for? And I think that yeah. that's like golf for me, at least from what I've seen, has been one of those sports where like every other lifespan for the most part of like different sports it's very very short yeah. whereas golf you could like you could be on tour until you're like 65 right yes. but in the in the sense of the Phil Mickelsons and the Rory's and the Tigers and the in the film and the um John Roms of the world <clears throat> they've already made more money than they can spend and they're still playing it's like okay well I really appreciate that mm -hmm. because the the money was the money is whatever um, in my opinion, but the fact that you're still playing to play to win to be competitive is really really cool yeah um but it I think it hangs onto the relevancy of what they want for their legacy and still being able to play at a high competitive level. Well, that's interesting because for a Rory and a Tiger, I mean, I think the legacy, like the money was not, didn't really seem to be much of an issue for it was, them. It was never the issue. Uh, I mean, that wasn't really the issue. You look at a guy like Rom, maybe you could understand that he's younger and so, you know, there's a lot more runway left, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you want to make as much as you can when you're young, obviously. Absolutely. Um, but... I can't help but think that if Rom wasn't able to play in the majors, he would have said no. There was no amount 100%, of money they could have offered. I agree. And, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about in relation to PJ Tour. Like, I really, really love what the PJ Tour stands for. And I think the majors is that factor. Right. Whereas, like, if it was just another golf tournament, they wouldn't care. Because it's like, well, if you play a live tournament, it's the same thing. Yeah. Just well, obviously less eyeballs. Um, but the fact that the PJ Tour gets to um, host those four majors over the course of the year, that's very, very appealing in the history books of all the players, yeah. which is why it was, at least in the beginning, it was tough because I think, it, like just in John Ron's case, it was tough where he wasn't sure whether he was going to be able to do it. So he was standing behind. Yeah, rewind a year and a half ago, right? right? So it's like, before he won. I don't think it was the fact that like, oh, well, the hundreds of millions was the deciding factor. Yeah. The money was a factor for sure. Probably, That's yeah, fine. Yeah. But aside from that, it was it was to solidify, okay, I can still play in the majors, mm. right? Because they want to play against the best players in the world. And in my opinion, at least right now, we're at a huge divide right now where half of the best players in the world on the PGA Tour and half of the best players in the world are, are on live, right? Yeah. It's kind of epic. Yeah. I'm going to say that. Like, it's kind of epic. Like, I will say the drama around it's probably been a good thing like at the end of the last masters i think the big thing that was going through a lot of people's head was like brooks kepka versus john rom right yeah. and rom was still on the pga at right, that time right, and it was right. like this extra added element and then i think it's also cool it's taken away from non-majors like regular mm -hmm. events where i don't think they mean as much as they would mm -hmm. you know you see scheffler run back to back and like that's historic and everything but you can't help but think that could have been different with DJ, 100%. with like all these 100%. other players that are that are on the the live tour now. But it kind of makes it epic. So when they do get back for these four events per year, it's like the clash of the titans, right? One hundred percent. In other sports, you don't see all the best no, players play don't. every game, right? No. The the World Series or the Stanley Cup Final or the Super Bowl. It's not like the best players. It's just two teams mm -hmm. that happen to be really good. Right? No, yeah, for sure. And I think that um, like my dark horse to win the Masters is Bryson. 
Like Ooh. he's, I think in Vegas odds, he's like plus 3,500 or something. So okay. he's, he's pretty down there. Yeah. Um, but he is one of the most underrated ball strikers and the most underrated putter in my opinion. I think people wrap him up. It's funny. It's a stereotype and you have the same stereotype. Yeah. I feel like, cause yeah. you get up, people see you smash the golf ball, right? but you don't realize, you know, I've, I've played with players who, who knew you and then they played yeah. with you you know like uh, sarah played with you right and she's like colton's the best putter i've ever played with. Right. yeah like i th that that's also been, that was a strength of my game before yeah exactly all the speed stuff, but, but same with bryson but, right but, he was yeah, a like, small guy right yeah he he's i've listened to a bunch of podcasts i mean him him and tiger got very close and they went down the rabbit hole of putting and like dimple effects and roll and like how the ball is manufactured wow. and launch and all that stuff so it's when, when you go down the rabbit hole of that like i think for me watching him evolve over the last four or five years it's been pretty wild to see. I think, hands down, he is the most underrated putter on the face of the planet. And the mm -hmm. fact that he's got all this speed to kind of um, have as a bullet in the chamber, yeah. for me, it's really cool because he can overpower a golf course like Augusta. Like, it, it's tight, he don't can. get me wrong, yeah, yeah. but since they've stretched it for the Tiger Tees, as yeah. everybody likes to say, right? Like, he's going to be able to overpower the golf course in a way, and the fact that he's so good, and in my opinion, like I said, he's such an underrated putter, He's going to be my dark horse to win That's the Masters huge, yeah. completely outright. Yeah, he. Yeah, and if it's not this one, you know, it's always an odds game. It's going to happen, Correct. I think, sooner or later. And what people forget maybe is that distance, it doesn't define you as a golfer. It's simply a tool that you have as a golfer, right? Correct. There's no such thing as just like a golfer who purely overpowers a golf course. Like, so no, they fun. have short, like he's, uh, I think when he won the U.S. Open, his chipping statistics, like in short game, was like by far the best. Yeah, his tournament. his scrambling was like was insane. Yeah, but again, he made <clears throat> made a lot of putts, and especially and, and a lot of people will hear that and they'll be like, oh well, I just need to work on my putting. Or I need to work on my short game. I need to make more putts. It's mm -hmm. like, well, you don't give yourself enough opportunities to do that or to have that problem. You know what I mean? Whereas, oh, yeah. whereas he is long. He's one of the best ball strikers on the planet, and he's giving himself twelve plus opportunities to make birdie every single round. And even at a 30% conversion rate on that, that's PJ Tour average. It's like anywhere between two and four birdies around. It's like it's 2.8 birdies around. Okay. Um, it might be a little bit higher now. Um, but that, but like, it, it's not a lot. So a lot of people are like, oh, well, I only made one birdie today. Well, you're probably only supposed to, yeah. to, to be honest, right? Yeah, because, I remember that. Yeah. Right? So it's like, when, when PJ Tour average is three birdies around, like you can't feel bad if you're not making like a couple, like if you make a couple around, like that's good. That's really you're, good. You're just, yeah. so the game is not built I, this is what I want to try to get across is the game is not built um, in the sense of like, how do I make more birdies? It's mm. how do I make less big, big number mistakes? Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. goal is to avoid um, definitely double bogey or worse. But in hindsight at the PJ Tour level is how can I avoid bogey? Not how can I make a birdie here? Because you're going to you're going to aim at flags you shouldn't have or you're going to miss shots and hit it at flags you probably didn't. Um, and you're going to get chances you shouldn't have. Yeah. But on average, like if the PJ Tour is making three bird, two point eight, even less than three birdies around, like I said, it might be a little bit higher now. Um, like that is that is good. So for the average ten handicap, like if you're making one birdie around, yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. very good. Yeah, it's very good. Well, I think well, I think the difference between a ten and a scratch golfer is like half a birdie or something. It's like that. literally, so literally not nothing. It's literally nothing. Around. But yeah. the difference is is they don't make as many big numbers or yeah. mistakes comparatively yeah. to a ten handicap. And I think what people forget too is this is all like averages right like you're gonna have you might have Outliers. three rounds in a row yep. where you make zero birdies yeah. and you feel like what the hell i can't make a birdie for my life yeah and then you're gonna go out and maybe make three one day and you're gonna be stoked and that's how it evens out to like one birdie yeah exactly right? like you're gonna have you're gonna have guys that and but you're also gonna have a floating scale in the pj tour or live whatever where you're gonna get guys that are gonna make five six around on average for the yeah. majority of their career and you're gonna get guys that make one or two on average like when you look at tiger go on a run or like a, a player who like dominates a tournament and then you look at their putting stats you'll be like okay players are like you know 50 percent from 10 feet and under mm -hmm. but like tiger that week could be like 35 for 36 it's like yeah it, but, but that's 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 how he's up there and that's yeah. why all these players that are winning and you see like oh he's he's putting out of his brain well yeah that's the difference. Like everybody is in minuscule statistical stuff. Yeah. They're very, very close to each other. And it's like the difference between um, you being like in the top 10, top 20, or just making the cut is literally the difference of like having the best putting round of your life, mm. which is like, yeah, when, when you play well, everything comes together and you feel like you're on a video game mode yeah. where you just play and you don't miss. And yeah. it's like, well, that's what's supposed to happen if you do that. But that's, that's not real life, though. Yeah, it's yeah. not real life. And and when we see players, they're having the best weekend of their life when they win a major or something. Like, quite literally, right? They're yeah. turning it on. And that's, I think, the thing that makes us so interesting, coming back to the live PGA thing and the fact that we have 
the greatest players now split between two tournaments is that each of those great players has a somewhat significant chance to win, right? I agree. And if you compare like a Bryson to like say a Mike Weir, who's just like you know there because he's won in the past, right? He's got a almost no chance of winning, right? Correct. But when you you know now you've got fifty percent of the great players are here and fifty percent are here, and I think it's getting close to that fifty percent. I think it is too, yeah. Um, because I got a fun question for you in a second. Okay. <laughs> but when you have them all together, you just like cut your odds in half of winning that tournament. It 100%. makes it so much like more pristine like that. But I got to ask you, we talked about uh, season two of Full Swing, and you know they focus on the Ryder Cup a lot. What I think would be so, so epic for golf, and if oh, they yeah. really wanted to bring these tours like yeah. together, I think they've painted the picture, they've pinned them as enemies. How do you sell a boxing match? It's true. Right? The biggest sport in the world. How it's do you sell really a boxing true. match? Yeah. This guy versus this guy, and they hate each other. They hate each other's guts, yeah. and they're talking shit, and yada, yada. So if they really wanted to sell this merger or whatever they want to do, it'd be better for both tours, is if they did a Ryder Cup-style event, live versus PGA, who do you think would win? Dude, I think, like, I, I even said it last year, I think, I think that'd be genius. It doesn't have to be worth anything. Right. Like, it doesn't have to be, like, for millions of dollars or whatever. I think it would be really cool. Because, like you said, like, even if you were to compare it to, like, the Jake Paul-Mike Tyson fight, mm. that is not a boxing match. That is an event. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a promotionalized yeah. event. So, when you look at it from that perspective, it's like, you're drawing in a huge crowd. Mike Tyson's a legend. Jake Paul, up and coming quote-unquote problem child yeah um you're just like you're putting butts in seats yeah which is great which is great for the sport like it brings eyeballs to the sport regardless of whether it's good or bad people mm -hmm. watch so when it comes to pj tour versus live um i think it would be like one of the greatest sporting moments in history to be able to do that and, and split and divide and i think there would be the only thing that i think that I'm just, I'm, I, the only reason I say this is because I can hear Rory in like the back of my head being like, I hate Liv and I don't like this. And it would just, it would, it would ruin the Ryder Cup and whatever. But it's like, it's not ruining the Ryder Cup. No. You're just, you're making it a spectacleized event. See, I think that the PGA Tour tried to do this and failed. What I mean by that is that, remember when they ran the match and it was like Tiger versus Phil. Right. Right. So when they did that to me, and I'm sure you, most people felt the same way. It felt like this, like Mike Tyson, Jake Paul fight or yeah, whatever. It, it felt just like, uh, okay, here's like, yeah, they're doing it, but no one really cares here. Like the money's going to charity. Like yeah. it just was like not, a, there was nothing in it. There was no skin in the game. It was right. very much just like for show. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't like an actual heavyweight, like, you know, uh, heavyweight boxing match back in the day. You know what I mean? Like an actual Mike Tyson fight, right. but this live versus PGA, Dude, those guys are fired up, and it's authentic. It's organic. Like, if they went and tried to do that, and it was, like, you know, Team Rory versus Team, you know, I don't know if it would be Bryson or who would, oh, Kepka, that'd yeah, be sure, pretty sure, epic, sure. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think it would be, I think it's a great idea. I think it'd be really, really cool if it would happen. Yeah. Um, in relation to who I think would win, it's really tough to say. I, I personally would err on the side of Liv, to be honest. Only because I think you got bigger hitters. Yeah. Um, not in the sense of like long ball hitters, but I mean, I think you got some bigger names and guys that have proven themselves in majors. Like, it's, it would be very splitting hairs, but I would err on the side of Liv only because I feel like they have a little bit more depth and horsepower um, to the squad if they were to pick like six to 12 guys. Yeah, I would almost argue that the PGA has more depth. But I think there's a lot of polarizing players on on Liv. Like what I mean by that is like Kepka, you'll see him fall off the map, and then he'll yeah. come out and win like two majors. Yeah. And then you know you got a guy like Phil Mickelson who it's just like oh he's so old and washed, and then he just comes out and wins like a major at like yeah. 48 or whatever, yeah. and you're like what the fuck? Bryson's another <laughs> yeah. great example where it'll be like you know he'll chirp the Augusta and then he'll shoot 10 over and it'll be like ah that guy, and then he'll come out and blow your mind right yeah. like. I think they got a lot of players like that. They've also got some young talents that switch there too. That are like dude, they sound like solid. a nineteen-year-old or something. It's it was crazy, like wild. Man. I'm like, like where do you find this kid? We even have yeah. players there that we don't even know how good they are, and they, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think before Rom switched, I I would have said PGA would have been very strongly in favor. Yeah. But after he switched, I think it's getting closer and closer, man. Yeah. I think it could go either way. Like no one's dusting the other two. No, no. And if it, they it, did, it's by chance. Yeah, it's not, and it, it would be very close. And then you get and you like you say like you get names like that come back out of the golf world like Anthony Kim. Yeah. Like dude, dude that guy looks fucking rough. <laughs> swing is so. Good. But it, it's so good. But he looks like he's been through the ringer. Oh, oh my god. I've, so 
But he hasn't said anything. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. he hasn't told his story yet. No, and I no, think no. it's like, because he said he's like, he said in an interview, I think it was today or yesterday that he was like, yeah, like I needed to, I needed to get my act together to be more emotionally stable for my family, for my mother or for my wife, for my daughter, blah, blah, blah. So like, I think he went down the route of like getting really deep into drugs, like yeah, yeah, going yeah. huge with depression. You see his face. You see his face and I'm like, um, people don't age like that. No. So I, I think there's a big understanding, underlying story there. And he even said, he's like, well, I'm going to, I'll tell my story when I want to tell it. Yeah, that's... And it's like that raises enormous red flag. And dude, he looks rough. Yeah. But I... yes, his game is like, I mean, yeah, he had some nerves and he shot whatever, but he shot 65 in the fourth round like, yeah. or in the third round. Like, Yeah, he came, came right back, man. Like his game is probably there. I mean, at this point, I don't think his game is the most important thing to him no. anymore. Like you said, dude, he aged 100 years. He's almost unrecognizable. It's It's wild. And it's sad. You look back at those pictures and he was just like this like, cute dude with a smile i feel like he was so young he yep. was like you look at his face it's like and his skin is so fresh and like yep. uh healthy and then you look at him now and you're just like is that even the same dude, dude like, it's not it's, it's it's not even the same person and and he even says he's like when i was when i was coming up in golf and he was gonna be the next time like he was the oh, next he was tiger woods like he was the next tiger woods and i think there was a lot of pressure with his fa- he even says that he kind of throws little digs and here and there, he says, like, my, I had a lot of pressure with my family uh, pushing me in that direction. Like, I didn't like golf. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't love golf as much as I do now. Right. Um, because I think there was so much pressure on him to be that next individual. And his parents, like, threw money at it and dove into it. And he's like, no, you're doing this for the rest of your life. I don't know for sure. But that's just yeah. my speculation. But I think that having that much pressure, I think, was like, he just, he needed a way out. Yeah, I mean, I think it was probably a, a, what seemed like a big way out, right? And when you get out of all that pressure, I mean, his life purpose must have been so lost. Yeah, what do that you do? Point. And that's and, and that's where I, th- I think, like, you will see guys in the corn fairy. Like, dude, there was a guy that won, um, or I think he either won or he came second, like, about a month ago. And he, and his, him and his, he talked to him and his, he talked to his wife and... Uh, and he's like, this is going to be my last tournament no matter whether I win or lose. And he has a desk, desk job starting on Monday. Oh, my God. So it's like, and then, and then I, I'm pretty sure he won. I, I honestly, I forget who it is. I'd have to fact check it. But yeah, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure he wins. And he wins like a million bucks. And he's like, yeah, you're at a desk job now. Because he just was traveling so much and bouncing between Corn Ferry Tour, Mini Tours, PGA Tour for like 10, 12 years. It's not as glamorous. It's, as you think, pe- yeah. People think it's like, it's all fun and games. You travel all the time. Dude. I speak from experience when I say this, and I, I didn't even get to that level. No, and right. it's like it's lonely as fuck to yeah. like to be able to do that, and like nobody is gonna be there for you when when shit gets hard. And even just like me driving to Arizona or like driving to Florida or like driving eight hours to play mini tour events, oh, yeah. doing Q school, it's like, dude, you're by yourself, man, all the time. Crazy. I see. Like, I remember Branson showing me. We pulled into the gym, yeah. and he was heading down south to play for the winter. And he just like built his car, so it was like basically a house on wheels. House on wheels yeah. yeah, like he had like laundry drawers oh, built yeah. in there and oh, everything. Yeah. And it's just like that's so. It just reminds me of when I was younger and playing music. And if I was like nineteen, twenty, and you're like you're gonna go hop in a van with like three other sweaty dudes and, and go tour and, for the, you'd be like, fuck yeah, like that yeah, sounds awesome. Yeah. And then as you get older, you're just like, that sounds so sounds, unappealing. Yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. And it's I think that's where. I think that's where the like live made such a such a good run with like so far with yeah. with like getting players to be committed to playing because they're like okay pressure's off I'm set for life now I can solely focus on my golf game mm-hmm. like it doesn't matter whether I play like shit or not because I know I'm going to be secure there's not that added level of pressure it's like okay now I have like my family's taken care of I'm taking care of let me just solely focus on golf and I don't play as much so I can still spend some time with them that's, that's like, the key I think though is that like you said focus on golf because I think if we could almost summarize this conversation, like, if you look at the Anthony Kim story, he got the money, he got the payout, it was guaranteed, all these things that they're giving on live, but he didn't get that opportunity to, to focus, still, to focus, focus on, golf. Some, on golf and still, like, you know, uh, set these records and these accomplishments and, like, have all of this uh, opportunity out there. The opportunity was really gone. Right. When you just hand someone, like, like a lottery, right? If you just hand someone some money. And I think the thing that the live if its entire success is going to depend on can it pr- offer those golfers that same opportunity to prove their excellence, right? All those guys did not get to the PGA just on sheer luck or skill. No. It was like they wanted to prove something, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I guess that's the big question. Is Liv going to offer 
a way to prove yourself. I guess we're going to find out. Um, well, thanks for joining me. Yep. Appreciate it. That was a good talk. Uh, if you guys are still, uh, still sticking around, make sure to smash that subscribe button. And as always, stay fast, and we'll see you for the next one.